Welcome to Cinematic Excrement. Today I continue my quest to review every movie that has won the Razzie for Worst Picture, and now we find ourselves in 1990, which means for the second time in the Razzie's very short history, we have a tie. And we're going to start with Ghosts Can't Do It. Mainly because my copy of The Adventures of Ford Fairlane hasn't arrived yet. That seller's not getting five stars, I can tell you that. Anyway. Ghosts Can't Do It, and yes, do it means exactly what you think, was written and directed by John Derrick and produced by and starring his wife, Bo Derrick. And I can't believe I already have to talk about these two again. It wasn't all that long ago that I reviewed their previous film, Bolero, which also earned them Worst Picture honors along with Worst Actress, Worst Director, and others. And if that wasn't enough, at the 10th Razzie Award Ceremony, Bo was also named Worst Actress of the Decade, and Bolero was nominated for Worst Picture of the Decade, losing to Mommy Dearest. I demand all of the recounts. Bo Derek was also nominated in 2000 for Worst Actress of the Century, which, if the Razzies were honest, would have been called Worst Actress of the Last 20 Years because they didn't look at any other part of the century, but she lost to Madonna. Not sure if I agree with that. Ghosts Can't Do It was the last film Bo and John made together, and indeed the last film John directed before his death. And boy, did they go out with a... Not a bang. What's the opposite of that? A fart? Yeah, they went out with a fart. Derek plays a woman named Katie. Anthony Quinn plays her billionaire husband, Scott, who she calls Great Scott or The Great One, which isn't nearly as endearing as the movie thinks, nor is the fact that there's about a 40-year age gap between them. Well, how about that? John Derek made a movie where his wife marries a man several decades her senior. Write what you know, I guess. Unfortunately, it seems their marital bliss won't last long as Scott has a bad heart. Hell, he has a heart attack in the first scene of the movie and has to be taken to the hospital, which leads to the first of many awkward transitions in the film. One minute we're in the hospital, and then... Will you shut up and listen to me? Whoa, okay, we're listening. It's amazing how so many things can be wrong in one shot. It feels like there should be something before that line, something that would prompt it, but no, that's where the scene starts. And then after that line, several seconds of silence. You asked him to shut up, he shut up. You got something to say or not? I'm listening! And as this scene continues, Scott is informed by his... doctor? Friend? Gigolo, I don't know, it's not clear, that he can't get a heart transplant because of his age. Somehow, Scott is surprised by this. Well, what did you expect, jackass? You're old, you've lived your life. What do you think a new heart is going to give you, five years tops? We're only a few minutes in, but between the ridiculous dialogue and downright horrible pacing, we already have a pretty good idea of just how terrible a filmmaker John Derrick was. Speaking of horrible pacing, it takes Scott seemingly forever to die. The movie keeps telling us Scott is living on borrowed time, but God must have given him one hell of a loan. And when he finally croaks, it's not the heart that does him in. Well, that came out of nowhere. Also, what the hell kind of zoom-in was that? And if you're wondering if Bo's acting has gotten any better in the six years since Bolero, prepare for disappointment. It's necessary that you hold me and love me, great one, you son of a bitch! <laughs> oh, Lord. Now, to be fair, I don't know if there was a right way to say that line, but that certainly wasn't it. Unnecessary slow-mo! But after his soul ascends to heaven, which is apparently little more than a black backdrop, Scott is allowed to continue communing with his wife by a fledgling angel played by Julie Newmar, who apparently brought enough ham for everyone. And you are my first case. I am acting. And this is basically the rest of the movie. The ghost of Scott continues to speak to Katie from beyond the grave, but except for one brief moment where they're dancing together, they're never actually in the same shot. And for the life of me, I can't imagine why they chose to have the two leads spend the entire movie talking to someone who's not there. Clearly, they didn't have the budget for decent ghost effects since the most they could do was project Quinn's image onto a pool of water, apparently. But what would have been so wrong about him just standing next to Katie looking completely normal except only she can see him? It worked for Ghost. Why wouldn't it have worked here? Certainly would have looked better than that cheap-ass water filter they went with. 
And of course, Katie spends the entire movie talking back to Scott despite being the only one who can see him. You would think this would cause everyone to assume she was crazy and back away slowly. But that would be the logical thing to do, which means it's not gonna happen in a John Derrick film. Instead, everyone just kinda goes with it. That seems unlikely to say the least. I know she's rich and she looks good naked, and yes, of course she gets naked in this movie, what else would you expect? But no one is at all turned off by the fact that she's constantly talking to her dead husband? Really? Oh, and if you're wondering why Scott decided to shoot himself instead of something less messy, like overdosing on pills, this is his answer. Real men don't eat quiche. Real men don't eat quiche? Are you implying that you are not a real man unless you blow your brains out? Because that is the dumbest thing I have ever heard this week. We are living in the dumbest timeline. Speaking of dumb, if you've never heard the expression, real men don't eat quiche, it's the title of a book by Bruce Feirstein. The book was intended to be a satire of masculine stereotypes. Sadly, the satire went right over the heads of many men, like John Derrick, apparently. Well, thank you so much, John, for doing your part to prove the stereotypes correct. You are a disgrace to my sex. For many reasons. Anyway, now that Scott has finally kicked the bucket, we can get to the actual plot of the movie. Scott and Katie are in a bit of a bind because while Scott is still able to hang around as a ghost because reasons, like the title says, ghosts can't do it. But Scott has a plan for coming back to life. The plan is for Katie to murder someone, and then Scott can possess his body. Apparently, coming back to life is that simple. Who knew? So it's up to Katie to find a young, sexy victim, and since she inherited Scott's massive wealth, travel expenses won't be a problem. So she begins her journey around the globe in search of a man her late husband can possess so they can start porking again. Wait a minute. A rich young woman is traveling the globe in search of a man to have sex with. Wasn't that the plot of Bolero? Oh my god, the Derricks actually did it. They recycled the plot of their last movie and added a ghost. That's all this is. It's Bolero with a dead guy. I knew John was a terrible writer, but I didn't realize he was lazy to boot. Well, Katie meets several men on her journey who proceed to follow her around everywhere because they apparently have nothing better to do. There's Winston, an old friend of Scott's played by Don Murray, a Sri Lankan mayor who is never referred to by name, he's just the mayor, played by Henry Jayasena, and the eventual victim, Fausto Garibaldi, played by Leo Damien. And with a name like Fausto Garibaldi, you'd probably assume he's Italian. But this Stunad can't even be bothered to put on a fake accent. And boy does his performance leave something to be desired. He has the same vacant expression on his face throughout the film. Even when he gets slapped twice, nothing changes. The lights are on, but there ain't nobody home. Good thing intelligence is not a requisite for possession. And when Katie is not trying to find a man to kill and then have sex with... And it just occurred to me how bad it sounds when you phrase it that way. She's doing business deals in Hong Kong with, oh God, kill it with fire. Oh, sorry, uh, reflex. But yes, that really is Donald Trump. In fact, that's exactly what it says in the credits at the end of the movie. Yes, that really was Donald Trump. So if you're tired of hearing me talk shit about this man, boy, did you pick the wrong episode to watch. Kate is here to do business with the MAGA fucker on behalf of her dear departed husband. I couldn't tell you what kind of business because the movie doesn't even attempt to make that clear. The only thing that's clear to me is John Derrick was never at any point in his life in any kind of business meeting. Dipshit Donnie is only in the movie for a minute or two, but even in that short span of time, his lack of acting talent is clear. And I can't say I'm surprised. He's been terrible at everything else he's ever done. Why wouldn't acting be on the list? And how has his hair always been that way? This man has an obscene amount of money that his father gave him. Surely he could afford a decent stylist. You're too pretty to be bad. Is he though? Anyway, at some point after that nondescript business meeting, something really bizarre happens. Some fat guy with a gun shows up at her hotel swimming pool to possibly kill and or rape her. But I guess Kate is a highly trained judoka or something because she flips the guy into the pool and... Wait, what? What in the sweet candy-coated hell just happened there? I swear I did not cut anything. She flips the guy into the pool, he points the gun at her, and then we immediately cut to the next morning where she's waking up in her hotel room. And for some reason, she's trying to unscrew this vent cover. Why is she doing this? And what happened to the fat guy? We never see him again. Is he in jail? Is he dead? 
am I dead? Is this my hell? This isn't the only part of the movie that's like this. It's a complete mess throughout. Several characters will show up at random without being properly introduced. Katie appears to know who they are, but she's certainly not going to tell us. And then they just vanish and are never spoken of again. I really wonder just how much footage ended up on the cutting room floor that could have filled in some of these gaps. And how bad must that footage have been if even John Derrick wouldn't put it in the final cut? Or is this like a snowman situation where they ran out of money before they finished filming and just edited together what they had? Well, after what seems like an eternity, it's finally time to kill Fausto. But even when he's trying to force himself on her, Katie still can't bring herself to bash his brains in. Not that there's much to bash in, mind you. But it doesn't really matter because later on he goes snorkeling and somehow gets caught in a net and drowns. And this is a huge problem for Katie and Scott because Scott apparently cannot possess him if he's dead. Which is odd because I thought the entire point was they had to kill Fausto for Scott to possess him. Does he have to be dead or alive? This movie can't keep its premise straight for 90 fucking minutes. In any case, Katie CPRs him back to life and Scott takes over his body and somehow retains his voice, which is creepy as hell. And since they technically didn't kill him, I guess that conveniently takes care of any moral quandary. And they live crappily ever after the end. And that is the absolute mess that is Ghosts Can't Do It. Given what we've seen from the Derrick so far, I would say this is par for the course. There's a reason why this film was made independently. After the Derrick's previous outings, no major studio would touch their work with a 10-foot pole. The dialogue is terrible, the plot is an incoherent mess, John's directing is laughably inept, he has no sense of pacing and the transitions are awkward as hell. While Anthony Quinn wasn't too bad, most of the acting, especially from Bo and Leo Damien, just plain sucked. As I said earlier, John never made another film after Ghosts Can't Do It, and while Bo continued acting, her star in Hollywood had faded considerably since her meteoric rise in Blake Edwards 10. I mean, her highest profile role of the 21st century was Sharknado 3. I think that says it all. Ghosts Can't Do It did get some sort of theatrical release, but Box Office Mojo doesn't even have any data for it. According to IMDb, it made just $25,000. Even though this movie clearly had a very low budget, I can't imagine how that could be anything less than a spectacular failure. Even when you factor in inflation, the Blair Witch Project cost more money to make than Ghosts Can't Do It made at the box office. The movie was nominated for nine Razzies and won four. Aside from Worst Picture, Bo Derek won her third Worst Actress Award, John Derek won Worst Director for the second time, and Donald Trump was named Worst Supporting Actor. I will give the Razzies this much credit. They were way ahead of the game when it came to shitting on Donald Trump. And I do respect them for that. Well, I think that about wraps it up for Ghost Can't Do It. I know this review has been kinda short, but honestly, there's really nothing more to say. There's just so little that actually happens in this movie, and what does happen is horribly confusing. Suffice to say, this movie is bad and is not worth your time. It might seem like it could be enjoyed ironically because of the weird thing they're doing with Scott's ghost, but trust me, it gets old pretty quick. Perhaps it could be studied by film students as a prime example of how not to make a movie, but otherwise I can't recommend it. And now that we're done with Ghosts Can't Do It, we get to move on to the other worst picture winner from that year, which is apparently about a guy who was named after a car. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. Friday.